Hey friends, we are back at Build 2019. It's live, live, live. I love it. We've got a studio audience of dozens, dozens <laughs> of people here at Build 2019. We love you all. We appreciate you very much. We are here with Jeff Holland and Eduardo Lariano. How are you, sir? Very good. Nice seeing you again. Nice to see you, sir. Your beard is looking just wonderful today. Uh, that's not what my wife said. But. I think it's <laughs> lovely, and I, I am, I'm envious. I wish I had a beard as nice as that. Um, and we're going to talk about serverless. And I'm understanding that a whole lot of servers are being built so that we can say there's no servers. That's right. They feel very underappreciated, too, because they're doing all this work, and we keep saying serverless. And, uh, but they're there. And there's a lot of servers that are powering this experience to let people write serverless apps. Right, you're hiding all the servers effectively behind this giant cloud-sized slider bar mm. that's att attached to my credit card, right? I mean, you can go as big as I want to. Like, how big can serverless get? How big can Azure Functions go? Uh, as big as anyone needs. Uh, and it, it really is. It, the, the whole point of serverless and what we're trying to accomplish is, I just want to focus on my application code. I want to write what needs to happen, whether it's a, an HTTP API or a background process on a queue or event stream. And the rest is taken care of for you. Like we often talk about it in this analogy of you could go own a car, and if I need to get from the convention center to the Space Needle, I could go purchase a car, I could pay a lease and drive it there, or I can just open up the Lyft app and say I want to get from here to there, and uh, someone's going to pull up, pick me up. I'm not worried about gas. I'm not worried about directions. Serverless is much more like that mm. for your applications. That's I'm really just going to give you my code. Take care of everything else for me. I don't want to have to deal with it. That's a really good analogy. But then it gets even more complicated. You have to buy insurance for the car. you got to SSH into the car and run app to update. <laughs> right? Suddenly, things get really complicated, because that's effectively like a virtual machine. Right? We, lo we lost the analogy. You, think the analogy, <laughs> you remote into the, You run Windows Update on the car. Right? It's quite complicated. No, but it's a really good analogy, though, because the idea is that you, you get a virtual machine. You're like, I'm going to build an app. But before I do that, I'm going to go and buy a CPU and put it in a box and put memory in it. So we got computers in boxes. And then we got virtual computers in boxes. But I still have to think about them. I have to love them and care about them and water them. And then we said, well, no, platform as a service is the mm -hmm. way to do it. I'll handle the computer. You handle the platform. With serverless, you're really making, I make a function called do it, and you do it. That's right. And you do it as big and as loud as you want to. Yeah. Well, and what we love about it, and just talking to someone here at Build, one of our customers, they're running their application during Black Friday. And you never know if these things are going to be successful or not. And this guy is monitoring live his application scale without changing his code. And he sees hundreds of instances literally running. And he's like, can this thing really scale? Can I handle the Black Friday load? And things work just fine. And he didn't change his code during the whole event. All he did was just watch the Azure monitor live stream and see just the, just the spike going up, up, and up, and the application responding. So, that's the beautiful part of it. But so we, we talk about how great that is, and we tell magical stories about, you know, there's always the Black Friday story because everyone's trying to sell something on Black Friday, and they move the slider bar or they do nothing. The slider bar moved itself and it's scaled. But you do have to change the architecture of your apps, right? I can't take my my crappy app I wrote ten years ago and make it serverless suddenly, right? I need to think about architecture. I have to think about responsibility of the different the different segments of the application. Don't I need to have a, a, a they call it a microservices architecture? Yeah, and, and often even with serverless, it's event-driven architecture is really the architecture that mm. people are talking about. Okay. And you're right, though, where in order to take advantage of serverless and really make it serverless native or cloud native, you, you do have to think about how do I take my code and make it so that run this in response to an event. And maybe what used to be one big app that had a few while loops and a few endpoints, this now turns into a few functions that it's like, hey, when somebody adds something to the cart, run this bit of code. Then when they click checkout, run this bit of code. But we do expect, if you want to take full advantage and, and take these benefits, you will need some refactoring or at least some rethinking for event-driven architectures. Interesting. I appreciate that kind of that correct correction you gave me there, because simplistically, I could think about a tiny services that are up all the time and, and waiting. But you're saying they don't really have to wait. They, they, don't, they just do the work when the work shows up. And then they I don't get charged, I assume, when they're not working, right? Yeah. That's right. And in order to take full advantage, you also be, be conscious of, I want to let the sort of the CPU go. I want my code to not be waiting for something. It might take a variable amount of time. If you feel like you're going to wait, just tell CPU, hey, run this async. Let me move on. So that way, you can pack a lot more executions in parallel, too. That's another architectural thing that we recommend people do. Try to do one thing only and try to do one thing that it try to run async as much as possible. Okay, so you do one thing, you do one thing well, you get out of the function, and if it's any kind of work that needs to happen offline, that's another uh, 
just-in-time thing to do, like another yeah. event. So, um, hey, here's an image. Okay, I take the upload of the image. Now, do something really complicated and long-running on the image. You wouldn't want to hang at that point. Maybe you put it onto a queue, put it into storage, and then another function picks that up and runs up into it. So you're saying, I don't want to shove my entire app into a single exactly. function. Exactly, yeah. And once it gets uh, more complicated, and some applications, real applications, they have these complex steps, and they run to, need to run one after the other in a certain sequence, and you need to have some state. That's when we have this thing called durable functions you might have heard of that allows for you to orchestrate and coordinate all these activities to run in a certain sequence and pa passing the state forward and do error handling in a single place. So you have more advanced concepts that deal with sort of advanced application scenarios too. Before we get into the, the great stuff that was announced at Bill, maybe you could expand on that word durable. What's durable about the function? It's saving its state for a minute. It's a long running workflow of, of sorts, isn't it? Yeah, so um, the way durable works is on behalf of our customers, we do save the state. So we know exactly where execution uh, is at all times. And something happens, your code dies, an error happens. We know exactly where to pick up from and continue your execution. And that, that durability allows for your function to run essentially forever. Because you could have something that's going to wait for a long time. It can pick it up any time later and continue running from where you start. Yeah, when you say wait for a long time, it could be wait for an email from someone or that's wait right. for someone to push a button, like yep. wait, wait days in just in a, in a suspended state until someone clicks confirm my subscription. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and in the same way, uh, you know, kind of explaining where durable fits, all the goodness you described with the event driven, where it's like, hey, just do work when there's work to be done, and when there's no work, don't pay. Durable will build your app in the state in that way so that if it takes a week for somebody to click that email, mm -hmm. you're not paying for anything during that week. Like your, your function may have scaled completely to zero, your charges are zero, somebody clicks subscribe, that drops an event, your function wakes up, and it starts from that point and keeps moving on throughout that workflow that Eduardo described. So very cool stuff. I've got 16 or 17 websites that are running in Azure right now in app service, and I've moved pieces into functions. But is it desirable or is it even possible for me to have everything be in functions where everything's just in time? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a common question that people come against is like, hey, how like, should everything be serverless? I, I think especially for websites in the past, some of the stuff that's made moving everything to functions challenging is there are things, because we are running on demand, where you might hit some cold start. So if somebody goes to you know, scotthanselman.com, uh, which I hope is the domain. Uh, it's not, but thank you for that. <laughs> uh, Scott Hanselman appreciates the plug, the other one. You can Google me with Bing, you'll find it. <laughs> uh, but there might be some additional latency there. So sometimes you've seen people with like traditional, maybe they're using MVC, they have middleware and those other pieces. You can't just take your .NET MVC app and run it as a function, right. both from a programming model point of view, but also from, I might get some extra latency that you're not getting with app services. However, one of the things we are striving to do is make it so that if you do want those benefits, Maybe we give you options like this new premium plan where you can say, I want to write this as a function, but let me turn it on so I never hit cold start. Or we just expose some new dependency injection stuff so that maybe you can inject middleware or other pieces the same way you're doing with your .NET apps today, but have them run as functions behind the scenes. So I think it's fine. And in fact, the pattern we see the most is exactly what you're doing. I've got my site. I'm going to start moving pieces to functions. But I think we're moving towards a world where more and more people are going to start to be able to write things in a serverless way. And it's Eduardo and I's job to make sure that people have the tools, the capabilities, the experience that they expect to do that that feels natural. Very cool. Um, there were some mind-blowing updates. What are those updates? Blow my mind. Oh my gosh. There are, there are, there are a bunch of updates at Bill. He, he just always... challenged you a bit, too. I know. Blow his well, mind, I saw you, were, you were looking at your blog <laughs> earlier as a reference. There's seven that? things I just think I'm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't remember. Rattle them off. What do you got? So I mentioned some of them. So a lot of our customers develop on .NET. They want the best of .NET. I heard the .NET team is wonderful. You might know some of them. And um, so dependency injection was a big one. Like, how do I actually plug in either my test framework or some other logging mechanism to my function in a dynamic way in a decoupled application? So that's a big one. We finally brought it to function, something we, we teased at Ignite, and people got super excited about. So now we're releasing it. That's one. We added also. Other programming languages, so just recently, like a week ago, we um, support also PowerShell Core running on Azure Functions. So a lot of uh, folks that don't think of themselves as the developers, IT pros, SREs, they can run those scripts, regular scripts to react to the infrastructure, cloud automation type of stuff with functions now. It's very easy. It's a very event-based type of thing. Like something changed on a VM, you want to react to it. So that's another one that we did. On durable functions, we now have the stateful 
pattern now. Big also entities, yeah. State for entities, also known as actors. Very okay. common for IoT scenarios. So if you're familiar with Durable, this is going to feel very familiar to you. It's not a way that you can implement and represent your code in functions. That's also new. Um, any of them that you want to go deeper oh, before well, I keep going? I, I see settling? that you've got a laptop with some code open, and I want to make sure that we have to sure, show I, code. This was, I, this was the flexible, let's see where Scott wants to go laptop right now. So is that what we're go doing anywhere now? On is that, thing. Is, has this devolved into let's see where I want to go? <laughs> <laughs> Evolved is the right word there. We can I show. I appreciate that. I do think Why don't it's we bring up your, your computer Because we have talked here. about Durable. This is the most boring screen demo ever. Uh, <laughs> Could you just literally just, bring up the documentation? Which, <laughs> I, never, I didn't know where. If this isn't running in a function, gonna go. then I'm going to. <laughs> so this is the stateful entity pattern. And I'm going to stop here for a second, because I do think this is worth double clicking on. So here I have an Azure function <laughs> in docs. Uh, but it, is, it has what's called an entity trigger. So this is going to be a counter. Now, I could have many of these counters. This could be like connected to my Fitbit or my Apple Watch. Maybe I have Scott's counter, Jeff's counter, Eduardo's counter. I can keep an instance of that counter for every single person that I have. And we are going to manage the state okay. for it's you. It's not a static. Uh, it's it's yeah. an instance. And it's an instance. That's right. right. Uh, and this pattern that we've just announced makes it so that I could say, hey, go add a step to Jeff's counter. This could have been a week after your last step, because I don't know, maybe you've been sitting at this host desk the whole time. We're going to rehydrate that function, rehydrate your state, make sure your step goes up plus one. Uh, Pick it up where we left off. There. Pick up where you left off. So this is a really nice pattern for like IoT devices, where you want an instance of a function execution with some state for my thermostat, for my you know, conference room, whatever else, and then managing as people move, as people come in. Or gaming is another big scenario. Like, I want to build words with friends. But where is this? Where, where, there's the state within the context of the function, and then there's a the state within the context of my app. Am I putting mm -hmm. it in a database? Am I in Cosmos? How do I manage the state that you manage transparently and the state that I manage explicitly? Yeah, so the one we do transparently is using Azure storage. Uh, one of the other mind-blowing updates is that we now also have preview support to do this in Redis which we know has been popular, like IoT people want to do. Yeah, but there it is. Yeah. There it we is. got it. My brain is exploding. Uh, but, but it is a very common pattern where it's like, hey, I have some state here which can be managed for me, but maybe I'm going to align this with some data in Cosmos. So transparently, we'll do it with, Co or with Azure Storage and, and Redis, but we, we want to make that story even more extensible so that ideally we make it even easier. I just had a moment. You know, have His you mind got blown. <laughs> I just had a moment. <clears throat> <laughs> because people are asking questions, and, and the number one question that we can see over on the board here is like, but I, I don't understand. What's serverless? What's serverless? I'm thinking about services. It's not serv it's serverless, but it's server full. That's exactly service right. full. Service, service, service full. full. There you uh -huh. go. That's a thing now, t shirts. It is. <laughs> um, because what I'm thinking about is I'm going to use Redis for this, I'm going to use Azure Storage for that, I'm going to use Cosmos for this. Yes, there are computers involved at some point. Yeah but I have a world database in the form of Cosmos that I don't have to think about scale anymore. It's fine. I've got an unlimited disk. It's not a C drive. It's just the world C drive. It's Azure storage. I've got Redis, which can Redis service on Azure, can scale as big as I want. And then I've got functions which can handle my CPU. And again, yes, there's computers. You handle them. It really is the ride sharing kind of solution. That's mm. amazing. I just got it. It's service full. That's perfect. Ooh. I'm giving you credit for that. You like that? It That's a thing now. We're going to make that a thing. It might have floated around a, a, a year or two ago, but I'm giving no. it is now officially Scott Hanselman's idea. Wait a second. You said someone's already had this Service idea? Serviceful, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because right. everyone. <laughs> but, but you came on it on your own, Scott. And it was. Oh, well, you on. led me down the primrose path, so <laughs> I will give full credit to you, Jeff Holland. But that's exactly right. And again, that was the, the very one special. point, just, just to emphasize, because I know we've, we've got some questions too. The whole purpose we're going for is make me as productive as possible. Let me just worry about the things I want to worry about. And that is really made possible with this serviceful world. Like, hey, I don't really want to have to deal with scaling my C drive. Azure Storage is a much more productive way to do that. Uh, that just permeates throughout the entire architecture. That's really cool. So the things that you announced, are they all GA now? People can use these things. They can go to the regular places on Azure.com and find information about Azure Functions? Or do they have to wait? So um, a lot of what we're announcing here, so the Partial support the, um, um, and the uh, stateful entities. entities. Wow, you really, that really just comes <laughs> uh, out naturally. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> um, those, are, those are preview preview releases we have. Cool. Also, the premium functions one, Jeff uh, quickly said the one that you can do reserved instances and then you avoid the cold start. Those are all in preview right now. 
but you can find full documentation on, on Azure.com. We released a blog post. That's what, that was my cheat sheet. Was yeah. the blog post. Yeah, the blog post is a great reference for people watching. We have links to all of the stuff we've talked about here, samples, docs, all that good stuff. So you can write real code and not doc code. Fantastic. I appreciate you coming here to blow my mind. I know it took a moment. It took a little work, but you made it happen for me. Thank you so much, Jeff Holland, Eduardo Lariano. We're going to go ahead and talk.